When you bleed, it's red. It's red because of the red blood cells. Red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. And by the end of this video, you're gonna know a whole lot more about them. So let's do it. The erythrocytes or red blood cells are the most common cell type in the blood. In fact, they are the most common cell in the entire body. But let's stick with the blood for now. There are about 20 to 30 trillion red blood cells in an adult human. That's trillion, like with a T. That's a whole lot of cells. And as we looked at in the last video of this series, they develop from a type of cell called reticulocytes. We're not gonna go through how they develop in this video, but if you wanna see how awesome that process is, check it out in that video. Now let's take a look at the structure of these red blood cells. First off, red blood cells have a very interesting shape. They have the shape of a biconcave disc. Now when something is concave, it curves inwards. And that's exactly what we see with red blood cells, except we see it on both sides of the cell. And that's why we call it biconcave, because it has two concave surfaces. Now, there are huge benefits to this. The first one is that it makes them small. And this is great because while yes, there are some large blood vessels in the body, there are many more itsy bitsy tiny little blood vessels that we call capillaries that these have to go through to supply blood to places that need it. The second reason is that it gives them a larger surface area to volume ratio. In other words, it's gonna make it easier for things like oxygen and carbon dioxide oxide to get into and out of the cell. Think about it like this. Let's say you have oxygen that's in the middle of a cell that has a shape of a sphere. It has a longer distance to travel to get to the cell membrane just so that it can cross into the surrounding tissues. But since you have this biconcave shape, it's like the cell membrane is just right there. Whenever that oxygen needs to get out or in, it can just more easily go. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, we've spoken about their shape, but there's also something else that's very interesting about the structure of red blood cells specifically the cell membrane. The cell membrane has some specialized proteins, one of which is called spectrin. What's really cool about this protein and others just like it is that it makes the cell membrane flexible. That comes in really handy when it comes to getting into some tight spots. The cell is basically able to fold over itself just to fit into those tight squeezes. And another interesting feature is that if you compare a typical cell to a red blood cell, you'll notice that there are a few things missing. Yep, it lacks key structures and organelles. For example, there's no nucleus, which also means that there's no DNA inside a red blood cell. It also doesn't have any endoplasmic reticulum. Now this organelle is used to make proteins. So we're not making any proteins inside the red blood cells. It also has no mitochondria. Mitochondria uses oxygen to make ATP, which is the energy currency of the body. So we're not using up any of that oxygen that the red blood cells carry, which is also a good thing. Here's the thing, red blood cells have one main function, gas exchange. We want to deliver oxygen and we want to get rid of that carbon dioxide. And our red blood cells are specifically designed to accomplish this. All that other stuff is unnecessary. So when they're developing, they get rid of all that extra baggage. In fact, there's a lot we can learn about life from these red blood cells. If you're carrying around a bunch of unnecessary baggage, get rid of it. But I digress. Let's continue with the red blood cells. We have to talk about what's probably the most important molecule in these cells. That molecule is called hemoglobin. This is a large molecule that's made up of four protein molecules called globins. These four globins are alpha one, alpha two, beta one, and beta two. Each one of these globins has a red pigment molecule bound to it, and that molecule is called heme. And these heme molecules have one ion of iron. Iron of iron, iron, iron of iron. Man, that's a tongue twister. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> Now this is the important part. Each iron molecule can hold on to one oxygen molecule. And that is why we want these red blood cells in the first place. Okay, let's do some math here. Each heme molecule can hold on to one oxygen molecule. Each hemoglobin has four heme molecules, which means that one hemoglobin can carry up to four oxygen molecules. Here's where it gets crazy. 
One red blood cell, just one, contains about 300 million hemoglobin molecules, which means that one red blood cell can transport about 1.2 billion oxygen molecules. That's billion, like with a B. That's a whole lot of oxygen. Now let's talk about how the gas exchange happens. When red blood cells are in the lungs, there's gonna be a lot of oxygen available, and the hemoglobin will latch onto the oxygen to become oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is bright red in color, and that's why the blood shows up bright red when it's exposed to oxygen. When red blood cells get to the other tissues, especially ones that are in need of oxygen, the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen will actually go down. And there's a structural change that happens to the hemoglobin molecule that makes it less likely to hold on to the oxygen. This is great news because it causes the hemoglobin molecules to actually release the oxygen, making them available for the tissues. Now, this is actually a detailed process that I can't go into fully right here, but I do have another video that goes into this more, as well as the idea of the Bohr effect, and I'll link to that in the description and you can check that out. There's one more thing I want to mention briefly and it has to do with carbon dioxide. Cells use oxygen in the process known as cellular respiration and one of the products of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide needs to be dealt with because it can cause serious complications in the body. Well, what we see is that 7% of that carbon dioxide gets carried in the blood as dissolved carbon dioxide. And 70% of it is converted into bicarbonate via an enzyme that's called carbonic anhydrase. And finally, 23% of the carbon dioxide will bind to hemoglobin to form carbamino hemoglobin. Yes, hemoglobin plays a role even with carbon dioxide. And of course, the blood travels then back to the lungs where the hemoglobin in the red blood cells can release the carbon dioxide into the lungs so that you can breathe it out and the plants in your environment can use it up. It's a beautiful thing. Now in the next video, we're gonna talk about disorders that can happen with the erythrocytes. What happens when things go wrong? I'll see you over there.